Okay, welcome to unit three. This is the unit on energy, energy and work and power and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of this is going to be reviewed, but again, we're going to be introducing some calculus. So let's get to work. Definitions, this is, this is all review. Actually, everything in 7.1 to 7.6 should be review. Um, we're reintroducing dot product, but again, so definitions, what energy is. For our purposes, it's the ability to do work. It's actually something that's really mysterious. You talk to scientists, physicists, like what exactly is energy? Very hard to say. But for our purposes, it's the ability to do work. We've got kinetic energy, potential energy, and work. Um, the thing about work that's interesting is that work can be positive or negative. These are all scalar quantities. The positive work can be positive or negative because we can be adding to or taking energy away from a system. Um, Potential energy can be negative, gra negative gravitational potential energy because when we calculate gravitational potential energy this way, mgh, what we're doing is we're referring to some standard, right? What's the potential energy from this point? It's not like absolute potential energy. It's relative potential energy. And, you know, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, which you should be aware of. The change in kinetic energy is kf minus ki, and that is often equal to the work. We're going to have a more expanded version of this conservation of energy and the way that it's related to work. But for now, we'll do that. So work, um, if I push on a wall, do I do work? No. Is work a vector or a scalar? It's a scalar, but I can't have negative work, right? And work, work done by a constant force, for now, is going to be Fd cosine theta. What is this? It's a dot product. Um, and so as a result, if the angle between the force and the uh, you know, the, the angle between them is important. If the angle is less than 90 degrees, then you're doing positive work. If the angle is uh, greater than 90 degrees, then the work is negative. Right? What this means here, if it's less than 90 degrees, that means you're pushing generally in the same direction as the velocity. And so you're adding to the velocity, right? Um, you're adding to the energy of the object. But if the angle is greater than 90 degrees, that means you're pushing in the opposite direction of the motion. And so you're taking energy away. So negative work, you're losing energy out of the system. You can think of work as the change in energy. Right? If the energy changes into or out of a system, that had to be done by work, by some external force. If the angle is equal to 90 degrees, then the work done is zero. Remember the, uh, the dot product, scalar product, right? <clears throat> um, A dot B is AB cosine of theta. Right, or it's also equal to ax times bx plus ay plus by plus az times bz, uh, you know, i dot i is 1, and that's true for the other one, j dot j is 1, k dot k, and all the other ones, i dot j, j dot k, k dot i, are all 0. Um, the next thing with the, these two spies that are there, uh, the work, work a force does on an object depends on the angle between the force. So just some examples. The work done by the normal force is zero, because the normal force is pushing up, but the displacement is sideways. The work done by gravity is zero. Uh, the work done by the um, spies is Fd, right, cosine theta, or Fd cosine 40. If, if friction was present, then the work that friction would do would be the force of friction times d times cosine of 180. Right. Why is that? Because the friction is taking energy out of the system. If the friction wasn't there, this thing would just be getting a lot faster. But it's not getting up to that speed because friction is there. It's removing the energy over time. So in general, in general, normal force does zero work. Friction force, in general, does negative work. Gravitational force does negative work if the displacement is up. And it does positive work. Right? Gravitational force then does positive work when the displacement is down. Okay, so here's an example. Right, we're given a force and a, a displacement. It says calculate the work done by the force. And so this is going to be uh, F dot D will be um, 2I plus 3J uh, Newtons times 4I meters. So 2i and 4i gives me 8. And then 3 times, I've got, it's just 0 there. So this is just 8 joules. 
is the answer. And now we want to know uh, what is the angle between F and D. And so we've got two ways we can do this. Right? Remember, FD, um, FD is also equal to FD cosine of theta. And so I could do this where I take the magnitudes and, um, you know, you know this. Uh, th well, I know this is equal to this. So cosine of theta could be f dot d over the product of the magnitudes. And I already know this, but then the product of the magnitudes, I have to do square root of uh, two squared plus three squared times four squared. So that I mean, I could do that. But let's not forget some basic tools that we have. This is in the i direction, right? So this is the displacement. This is uh, like this. It's over 2 and up 3, right? Here's 2. This is 3. Can I find this angle pretty easily? Because isn't this angle, um, or no, sorry, this would be 3. Isn't this angle uh, just the inverse cosine of or inverse tangent of 3 over 2, All right? Why can't I do that? So <clears throat> um, it should, I think it comes out to 56.3 degrees. You just do inverse tan of opposite over adjacent. You can do this, but don't forget simpler things that work. Um, it's easy to be so educated that you become stupid. Don't let that happen. Example two, work done by a constant force. So we've got a person pulling a child in a sled. This is a, a common kind of problem that you've, you've seen before. Okay. And so uh, it says, how much work does the man do pulling the sled? Uh, so let's do the, the free body diagrams here and figure all this out. So we've got to do some work here to figure out what this force is so that I can then take the, uh, multiply this by the displacement. So Fg, this is 45 times uh, g. What did I use g here? What did I use? I used 9.8. But let's just say this is, all right, Fg. So uh, this is Fa. So this is Fa cosine theta. This is Fa sine theta. So I'm going to get rid of this one now. And I know that Fa cosine theta is equal to mu Fn, which is this. Okay. And then um, Fa Fn is going to be equal to uh, Fg minus Fa sine theta, right? And so uh, what we can do is we can substitute, I can divide this by mu. Right, what do I want to do here? If I'm solving for Fa, I can solve both things for Fn. So this is going to be Fa cosine theta over mu is Fn. So now I've got Fa cosine theta over mu equals Fg minus Fa sine of theta. So I have Fa cosine theta equals mu Fg minus mu Fa sine of theta. I'm going to go up here now. Bring the Fa's together on the same side. So Fa cosine theta plus mu Fa sine theta equals mu Fg. This is getting messy. Um, so, yep, so now I factor out Fa. Sorry. And this is then cosine theta plus mu sine theta equals mu Fg. So Fa is equal to mu Fg over cosine theta plus mu sine theta. When you plug in all the numbers, 0.1, and this is 45 times 9.8, 
this is uh, 30.1, 30. You should get something like 48.1 newtons. So that's what FA is. Um, so now we want to know how much work does the man do pulling the sled. So that's just going to be this, FA cosine theta times uh, the distance that it goes. And we say that it has a displacement of 5 meters times, I'll just write D. So this is 4.81 times cosine of uh, 30 times 5. And I think you should get 208 joules. B asks about um, how much work does friction do? Notice this, that he's pulling at a constant velocity. So even all this work, he hasn't increased the energy at all. It's still going at the same speed. There's been no change in the kinetic energy. And so that means that friction has done this same amount of work. And so negative 208 joules, or the same magnitude of work. See, it says, what, what is the net force in the sled? Zero newtons. Um, what about uh, D, the net work done? Zero newtons, or zero joules. Why is there zero, or why is there zero net work done? This is the force of friction, this is or the um, work done by friction, work done by the man, those add up to zero. Also, we can see there's no change in the kinetic energy. And the ch because E, the change in the kinetic energy. Okay, now this is review as well. Since work is force times displacement, we can look at this as the area under a graph. Now, in the next thing, 7.8, 7.9, this is where this is really going to get jacked up. Um, a lot. This is going to go to the next level. I'm going to introduce some new calculus later on. But for now, we're just recognizing that force times displacement gives me uh, work done. This should all be review. And so I'm just going to put the answers up to example three and work along with this. All you're doing is finding the area under the graph, and that'll tell you how much work was done in that time. Okay, so you should be able to do this. It's just the area of a triangle, area of a rectangle, area of a triangle, and then the total, add them up. All right, so let's try example four. <clears throat> okay, so for this section, write eight joules, 12. These are the, this is the amounts of work done in each of these sections. I can have negative work because I can have, uh, I'm taking energy away from the system, and here that shows up as negative area. I'm below the x-axis or the d-axis on the graph. And so I have negative work, that means I'm taking energy away from the system. So the total work done, the total energy added to the system, whatever it is, is 12 joules. Now for example five, the key thing here is keep in mind this is acceleration versus displacement. How does that work? Well, force and displacement is the area that gives us the work done. So if it's acceleration, well, how do we get force from acceleration? Just multiply by the mass. You can do this two ways. You can take the numbers as they are, just take that whole axis and multiply it by the mass, or you can get the whole area and then multiply by the mass at the end. Okay, either way, um, let's find out what, uh, what the answers are going to be. Uh, so, that's it for that. Now, now we're going to, so that's, this is the graphical method. The analytical method is going to involve some calculus. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, imagine that you're not given a graph, you're given a function. And let's say that the function looks something like this. By the way, we're on now to uh, 7.8. Eight and seven point nine. We're skipping seven point seven for now. Let's say the graph looks like this. Here's force. Here's displacement. Okay, how do we do that? We don't have a formula right now for finding the area under this graph. Well, one thing we can do is approximate, and maybe you've done this. You know, if I can draw rectangles, kind of like this, and then I find the area of the rectangles, that'll that'll work, right? But what if, you know, how, do I, how, do, how many rectangles do I draw? And, you know, how wide are the rectangles, that kind of thing. It becomes apparent pretty quickly that the smaller, the thinner I make these rectangles, the better the approximation is going to be. 
So what if you know I had something like like this, where I could you know I have this rectangle, all these rectangles. And this is good. This is going to give me a good approximation, but couldn't it get even better? Couldn't I make these even smaller somehow? And what is this? This is force, right? Force, which is a function of, of uh, the displacement. And this right here is delta x. What I want to do is, in order to get the best approximation, is I want to take the limit of force times delta x, but as delta x gets closer and closer to zero. Right. Um, so I'm looking, I'm looking at, a, at a limit. And this is covering all of these um, things, by the way, all these uh, slides. I'm just sort of talking you through it. This idea of approximation and getting the area. What if we make it really small? So what we're going to end up with now is definite integrals. Um, and in, in physics, 90% of the time we're going to do definite integrals. Uh, in calculus, you'll do indefinite integrals, sometimes in here as well. Um, but we're, we're going to get into some complicated stuff, but it's going to be very specific, and it's the same kind of complicated thing over and over again. Um, and so, what are, we, what are we talking about here? Um, it turns out that if this function, if f is, let's say, uh, d squared, then the area under this graph is just the antiderivative. You know, taking the derivative gives you the slope. Taking the antiderivative actually gives you the area. So when we're taking the antiderivative, we're thinking backwards. I'm saying, what function, when I take the derivative, would give me this? And so I can imagine, OK, I've got some, something. Well, when I take the derivative, the exponent's coming down. right? And so then. Uh, this, we have to have started off with d cubed. But if I take the derivative of this, I get 3 d cubed. Right. So, and I don't have anything here. So that means this must have had a 1 third in front. If I take the derivative of this, I get that. And again, here's the point. Taking the area under the graph, and I'm not going through the proof or anything. You're taking my word for it. We'll get to the proof thing in, in calculus. Um, that taking the area under this graph is like doing a backwards derivative. We call it finding the antiderivative. And we're going to set, and what we do is we set limits to this. Okay. So for monomials, right, if f of x in, is in this kind of form, you know, d squared, then what I'm doing is I'm adding 1 to this, which you can see there, and I'm dividing by whatever this new exponent is. What's up? OK, now I got kicked out of the room. And so here I am back in the, in the office. Here we go. So let's continue. OK. One thing to think about here is that uh, why can't, you know, looking at the, the, the instructions here, um, why can't n be negative 1? So why can't I have x to the negative 1? Um, this realize we, this would be 1 over x. And so then, or rather, sorry. Um, so then when I'm, when I'm adding 1, then I'd be ending up with, you know, on the bottom of that fraction there, 1 over n plus 1. So that means that I can't just use my normal rules to anti-differentiate this. All right, there's going to be something else that we do when we have this. So now taking definite integrals. So I'm looking for an integral over a, a definite uh, period of time. And so what all this looks like, so let's, do, let's take the example that's here. So we're looking for the integral from 1 to 5 of x squared dx. All right, what does this mean? The dx here is referring to the thing uh, that I'm integrating with respect to. Uh, you know what, let me... Let me write this again. So what is this giving us the area of? Well, nothing in particular. Um, 
re, you know, you remember this dx, if I had some function and I'm taking the derivative, I would have like dy dx, something like that. So dx is like a little piece. And in the graph, x squared is giving me the height, and dx is that tiny width that's here. So delta x, which is now dx, as delta x approaches zero. So this is really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm adding up. So instead of a, a sigma like this, I'm stretching out an S, so a summation. I'm doing a summation from one to five of all of these heights at these various locations times these tiny, tiny little widths. That's, that's what this means. All right. And so what I do is I, I anti-differentiate and I end up with one third x cubed from one to five. And so now I plug in these two and I subtract. So this is one third five to the third minus one third one to the third. That's the idea, right? I'm plugging in the final minus the function of the initial. <clears throat> and so this ends up being uh, one third of 124. Okay, and that doesn't come out equally, so I'm evenly, so I'm just going to leave that like that. Let's take a look at example two. Well, it's a little different. So this is now taking the integral from 1 to 5 of 4x squared dx. Okay. Um, friend saying hi. And then, so this now is going to become 4 thirds x cubed, right? If you're getting confused going from here to here, just think, what is the antiderivative? The derivative of what would give me this? Right? And I'm going from 1 to 5. So this now is 4 thirds. Um, let me do this. 5 cubed minus 4 thirds times 1 cubed. By the way, when you're doing this, anything that's out front here, you can sort of leave in the front because those are things that are going to be common uh, common factors, right? You can factor those out. So this is the same thing. So this ends up being um, 4 thirds times 124 also, or, you know, 496 over 3. Okay. So now, what if the function is equal to 1? 1 dx from let's say one to five. Well, what is this? What does this look like? Right. This is a function. What's the function? The function is just a line at height one. And so, from going from one to five, here's one. Here's five. This should end up just being, you know, like four times one. Four. Well, the derivative of what gives me one? Let's work this way now. The derivative of x gives me one. And so I'm evaluating x from 1 to 5. So this is going to be 5 minus 1, and it gives me 4. It's exactly what I, what I thought it would be. Okay, and then what if it's not 1? What if it's 3? Something like this. And we're going to do this from 1 to 6. Again, same thing. This is just a horizontal line um, at, at height 3. So the derivative of 3x would give me 3, right? The anti the derivative of this gives me this. I'm working backwards. Um, I know what variable to put in here because I know this. This is dx, so this is becoming an x. This is from 1 to 6. So this is 3 times 6 minus 1, or uh, 15. Let's see. Um, all right, then if we have a polynomial, same, it works the exact same way. So here again, from 1 to 5, and I'm going to do uh, 3x squared plus 4x dx. Okay. And now we're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, the announcements. Okay, and now they're doing the announcements. You might hear them in the background, but we will press on. Okay, 
the antiderivative of this is 3 over 3 x cubed plus, and this is going to be 4 over 2 x squared from 1 to 5, of course, right? So these simplify, thankfully. So this is going to be 5 cubed plus 2 times 5 squared minus uh, 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 squared. Uh, so this is going to be 125 plus 5 squared is 25, 50 minus, this is 1, this is 2, so minus 3. So it ends up being 172 as our answer. Uh, that's it, no units. <clears throat> this is math, not physics, apparently. So now we're going to do some physics in example 5. And it looks like this. We have force, the force function, with respect to position, right? is 3x plus 7 newtons. How much work is done by the force between 1 and 6 meters? And so I'm taking the definite integral from 1 to 6 of this function. And I write dx. OK. And so I take the antiderivative of this. This is going to be 3 over 2 x squared plus 7x. And this is going from 1 to 6. Good. Now I plug in. OK, back to recording. Told me I had to stop recording because lack of disk space or something. Anyway, <clears throat> here's what we got. This is the solution to the problem. Uh, I think it left off where I was doing this, 1 to 6, and then I plug in 6 minus, and I take, I evaluate this uh, at 1. And let me make sure this is recording correctly. Good. And so then I get, I get this answer. And I was uh, explaining, how do I end up with joules, right? I do something here. I've got newtons. I end up with joules. What's going on? Keep in mind here that when we're taking an integral, we're, it's like multiplying, right? I'm multiplying this by this. And so this is newtons, this is meters. And so I multiply newtons and meters and I get joules. That's what, that's what I get. So let the units help you out. When you take the derivative, that's like dividing, right? That would be newtons divided by meter, meters because you're looking at slope. But when you're taking area, that's what taking an integral is. And you can let that help you. When you're taking a test or something and you forget, oh, you know, for this value, do I take the derivative or do I take the integral? I forget. Let the units help. If you think to yourself, I've got newtons and I've got meters, and I want to end up with joules, I have to multiply newtons and meters to get joules. Okay, taking the derivative or taking the integral, which one gives me multiplication of these two units? And integration is what gives you uh, multiplication. So let, let the units help you and keep in mind, Integration is like finding area. It's like multiplying. Der derivation is finding the slope. That's like dividing. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's take a look at this last example. Okay. Here we go. So the restoring force of a spring. Uh, and we're going to do a lot more with this later. Negative 450x. So what, what does this mean? Why is the negative here, by the way? Let's just talk about this for a second. If I have some spring, um, whatever the displacement is, like if this is the 0 and this is the position x of the block, what direction is the force? The direction of the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement, right? If I displace it this way, then the force is going to be that way. So that's what we're saying here. The force is just in the opposite direction of the displacement. Okay, having explained that, now we want to go from 0.2 to 0 meters. All right, how much work is done? Because, why do we need this now? We need this because the force is changing. It's not a constant force anymore. When we have a changing force, we've got to do this. And so, this ends up becoming negative uh, 450 x dx, right, multiplying the little the little horizontal pieces by the heights, right? This is the function. This gives me the height on the graph. And I'm going from 0.2 to 0. OK, so this ends up just becoming negative 450 over 2 x squared from 0.2 to 0. 
we like having zeros because now when I plug the zero in, it goes away. So it's like zero minus, uh, and then I plug in the point two, so it's um, negative 450 over two times point two squared. And I end up with nine joules. That's it. Okay, and then real quick what power is, we'll get into more of this later, but power is the rate at which work is done. And it's measured in watts, you already know that, that's all review. And that's it for the first part of chapter seven.